Welcome, everybody, to the Weekly Grind Podcast, episode number 103. I'm your host, Keith Fabry, with my co-host, IFBB Pro, Dr. Todd Lee. Todd, welcome back. What's up? All right. And with us tonight, we have with us the co-founder of Renaissance Periodization, Dr. Mike Isertal. Mike, welcome. Guys, thank you so much for having me on. Awesome, man. So I've been uh, watching you on, on YouTube probably for uh, the last year or so. Uh, on the Renaissance periodization videos, uh, you have a lot of good content as far as training, um, train, you know, basically training circuits and how, how to periodize your training. And some of the, I, I love the videos where you take the, uh, the power lifters and you put them through bodybuilding workouts. Those are my oh, favorite yeah. because they, they literally are dying like 20 minutes in. <laughs> That's, oh, yeah. uh, those are my favorite ones. So, um, talk a little bit about yourself, uh, your background and stuff and how you came to be where you're at. Well, you see, my parents met, and well, that's you know, <laughs> nine months later. Uh, I'm just kidding; it wasn't the same day, Jesus. So, yeah, I'm originally from Russia, and my family came here when I was seven years old. I grew up around uh, the Detroit area of Michigan, and I wrestled in school. And then, to get stronger for wrestling, I started lifting weights in high school. Sure. And I started getting more jacked, and I was like, oh, I really like lifting weights. And then by the time I got to college, I was started competing in powerlifting. And then in grad school, I started really falling in love with the idea of bodybuilding. I didn't really have a physique for it, but slowly but surely, I added some muscle and got rid of some fat and then started to look pretty cool. And then at that point, it was all my passion. So I went into graduate school with this in mind. I got a PhD in sport science from Dr. Mike Stone at East Tennessee State University, and that was really cool. I got to coach a bunch of athletes, became a college professor, and sort of right just before that, my friend Nick and I, we had had um, jobs as personal trainers in New York, and we kind of realized a lot of people were getting ripped off, especially by diet coaches, just like nonsense, BS. So we were writing diets and training programs for people, and we were tired of referring people to each other. It's just like, oh, my friend or colleague Nick we started a company to basically be able to say like, oh, you know, it's my coworker and you can work with him on diet or me on training and so on and so forth. As we started to get more and more clients, we needed more help. And I recruited some graduate students that were are now actually my lifelong friends and also sports scientists to help be coaches for our business. And at some point, people started asking a lot of questions of like, you know, why do you guys do carbs like this? Why, why fats like that? Blah, blah, blah. So we figured, okay, you can't retype this in an email 600 times. So let's write a book. So we wrote a book through Juggernaut Training Systems, Chad Wesley Smith, mm -hmm. The Renaissance mm -hmm. Diet, first book. It was really awesome. During the writing of the book, I had to break down how to design a diet basically uh, from uh, like a systematic perspective. And because I was teaching people how to design your own diet, and I got the idea that, you know, we could actually do this either in an app or in templates. We tried to do it in templates. They were uh, super crazy successful. Lots of people thought they wanted one. We replicated it in training. Uh, we did training templates. We published some training books. Company grew and grew and grew. And now we have a whole bunch of trainers, uh, or coaches working for us. Most of them have PhDs or world champion athletes and all crazy stuff like that. And now we have a diet app and a bunch of other digital products for training and a bunch more stuff in the works, tons of books. And now I'm on YouTube trying to sing the good word of RP. And we have a whole bunch of videos to make. And I have a timeline of videos that's years away from being me out of ideas uh so that's been really cool we've been reaching a lot of folks on youtube and i recently i was competing in bodybuilding for a while now but i absolutely sucked at it and then recently i actually put like a decent physique up on stage and uh ta-da i took second and the masters usa is in the super class as the shortest by like one foot super i think uh, <laughs> but i was really jacked and i was actually the leanest super uh, which is kind of neat yeah, I saw that you were at the Masters. You said, what did, what did you weigh in at? 225.6. <laughs> you were barely a super man. <laughs> yeah. I figured I just didn't care. Uh, I was just going to come in and, and try to look good. Right, right. So, you know, Which, that. yeah. Which is usually your best look. And most of the time, the supers aren't in the greatest shape anyway. So, exactly. if you can come in, if you can come in peeled at the bottom of that class, you've got a really good shot of winning. So, that's exactly it. So, so. All right. Um, you talk about I know the main thing for you that you do is the training is the training aspect uh, now correctly with with RP. As opposed to what? Um, 
most of your videos are training are training related as far as all the videos yes um you know we have diet videos but the 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 folks on youtube seem to really be interested in training and i in training uh i don't want to say i want to put too fine a point on this but i kind of said everything about diet that i ever wanted to say maybe 95 percent of everything uh i'm pretty good with dieting but i'm really interested in training now on a personal level because there's a lot of ideas about training that people have out in the world uh especially in bodybuilding that are just really bad ideas and it pisses me off that people look up to bodybuilders who don't know how to train and I want to get the word out there and teach people how to train well so that they don't essentially just like replicate real stupid stuff and not get the same results because they're not on a boatload of drugs and they're not gifted genetically that's and that's the main thing is that you, there's so many different training systems out there and yes they can different systems can work for different people but Really, it's some of these uh, genetically elite pros that literally can look at a weight and they're going to grow. And then you add drugs to the mix, they're going to grow a lot. You yeah. know, <laughs> they can pretty much do about anything with weights and and it's going to give them good results. Whereas Joe Blow, shit genetics, average person can do the same thing. And they're wondering, why the hell is this not working for me? And the first thing they go to and realize is I'm just not taking enough drugs, which sure. necessarily is not the problem. You just don't know how to train because Joe Blow, Ever Genetic, and Mr. Gen- Elite, uh, Elite Genetics over here are two different two different playing fields naturally to begin with. For sure. And even a boatload of drugs doesn't work because you're training like shit. <laughs> it doesn't make it for difference. For sure. Right? So I think there's a lot of assumptions that people make about people who are really jacked. And it's not like an assumption you would be really pissed about someone making. Like it's not some kind of intellectual massive flaw that you'd be like, well, you're just an idiot for ever thinking that. Um, but like, I guess one of the assumptions is even just normal gym people, when they see someone who's jacked, but they kind of just assume that person really knows something about how to train. I don't think they think like there's a basic foundational level of training that this person has clearly mastered, which is probably true. Like, you know, lift to lift weights, you know, to do that hard, you know, when an exercise grows your bicep, you feel it in your bicep. And if you don't, it's not a bicep exercise. Like that's the foundation of like, duh. And all the pros have that figured out. You know, no one's doing rear delt flies and being like, it's chest movement. They'd be like, what the hell? So they got that. But most people who look up to pros, they don't say, oh, okay, they have the basics down. They think, you know, at least one, this is charitable interpretation. But they say at least one of the reasons why this pro is this big is because they know something special about training that I don't. And I need to find out what they know because that's going to give me maybe not all of their mass. Maybe I'm intelligent and thoughtful enough to realize genetics matter. Maybe I know about drugs and they matter. But I think, you know, all that aside, they still should know something extra. And I don't know. I don't want to speak out of turn. But. I've met a whole shitload of pros and seen a whole shitload of them train. Can I swear on this podcast? You can swear yeah. plus as much as you'd like. That gets us more views. <laughs> yeah, like, you, like politics, religion, gear, it, we have no boundaries or morals. Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to fit right in. <laughs> so to, to do a nasty paraphrasing, uh, of one of my favorite economists, Thomas Sowell, there's the political side. I cover that. Um, it is by no means clear to me, it is by no means clear to me that pros on average know anything special at all with regard to training. And a lot of times because of their elite genetics and their willingness and actually just ability to tolerate a lot of gear, they may know a little bit less than the average like intelligent, dedicated gym bro who's like thoughtful about the shit. And I've seen, I've been to seminars where like thoughtful people who are like fibers into training ask a pro, like, what do you think about supinated versus pronated curls? And the, the pro doesn't know what those terms mean. Like, and then when explained to them, they're like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think both work. It's, you know, if it works for you. And like, motherfucker, that's not an answer. But like, I think people are looking to, you know, it's, uh, this is, again, I don't really mean this. It's just to illustrate something. But like, if you see a fucking dinosaur, like wrecking the city with his tail and breathing fire, you're not going to be like, oh, no, that dinosaur really knows kinesiology and tail movements. And he also knows, you know, thermonuclear generation because his, his 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 breath is nuclear fire. Like, he's a nuclear physicist. Like, no, he's just a fucking stupid dinosaur that happens. Like, he doesn't know how the fucking <laughs> atomic breath works. He just takes a fucking breath and shit blows up. So a lot of pro bodybuilders, pro athletes of any kind, are just motherfuckers with atomic breath. They don't know how the fuck it happens. They just do this and they're fucking huge. And they're like, oh, I feel like dumbbell curls. Like, shut up. You don't know what the fuck you're saying. And. A lot of people just look up to them. Now, here's the thing. There's tons of pros that do know this shit and mm-hmm. really can offer insight. But just by looking at a guy's muscles, you can't tell which one he is. Not everyone's John Jewett. 
You know, like a lot of guys don't put any thought into the shit at all. And the thing is, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're if your shit is working and you're healthy and you're jacked and you don't have to think about it and your muscles grow, fucking kudos. The only problem was the motherfuckers look up to you and they think, ah, this man knows something. Good luck. And then they do some bullshit routine that guy wrote or copy his program for six months. They have dick to show for it and they're fucking pissed. They should be pissed at themselves because they made the assumption that these people have a ton of knowledge. It might not be correct. I mean, it might be, a, you know, a pro bodybuilder may know about as much about his body as a, as a top race car driver knows about how to fix the fucking race car. Bro, that's what the pit crew is for. That's, you know, that guy's coach. That's what he's for. He mm-hmm. might not need his just coach says do this. And the guy does that. Like yeah. he might not know a whole lot and, and he might. So I'm just trying to throw some actual info out there to no, people so they don't get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, because I mean, you look at a situation where, like, you know, you, Ronnie Coleman, anybody who watched Ronnie Coleman train, Ronnie Coleman didn't do a whole lot right over his career, right? He just trained really fucking hard and really, really heavy, but he was going to grow regardless because of his elite genetics. And somebody who trains like Ronnie Coleman that just ends up broke down and hurt, but along the way, they're not growing because, you know, 800 pound deadlifts are doing absolutely nothing to grow their back whatsoever. But they think that the, they, they go online and they go, they Google search Ronnie Coleman drug protocol. And then they start following that and they fuck themselves up even worse along the line because that's all fake too on there because you you can't trust 90% of what you get on online as far as that goes. So, yeah, knowing how to all train right. and the basics of training is is, is key. I got, I got a real, real life example. But I can't think of his last name. It's Richard something or other. He was a bodybuilder in like 2004. I think he won the USA's or nationals overall. He was a light heavy. And Richard Jones. Richard Jones. Yes. Okay. So Richard Jones, I remember reading an article. Dude, brilliant. Thank fucking God uh, that you said that. I remember reading an article written by him in like Flex Magazine because he got scooped up by Flex immediately. You mm-hmm. guys are old yes. enough to remember yep. the shit, how shit worked back before Instagram and real magazines. Turn, turn Pro was a light heavyweight. He was, he was phenomenal physique. It's just beautiful physique. And he was like, I'm going to go. And that was the, he turned pro, I think 2003 or 2004, where yep. it was right the year after Ronnie Coleman did his 242 to 287 transformation from 2002 mm-hmm. to 2003 Olympia. Like that was when, you know, the revenge of Ronnie Coleman, like he lost to Gunter Schlierkamp and like the GNC mm-hmm. show of strength. And he was like, fuck that. I'm never doing that shit again. Let's <laughs> fucking gas it up. So he, Richard uh, Jones was like, you know, I'm going to do like this Ronnie Coleman style training, like hard and heavy. I've been kind of like using like, oh, whatever, like technique, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm going all in. And then precisely like one year later, he quit bodybuilding because mm-hmm. he was like, I don't want to do this to myself. And it, it's fucking sad because maybe he quit bodybuilding for 50 different reasons that we're not discussing. But maybe one of those reasons in part was that he thought he had to like basically hammer his fucking knees and back into pulp to get huge. And if someone had just gotten to him and showed him like, here's how you could do an exercise, loading the muscle a ton, loading the joint very little – you can actually any rep range within between five and 30 reps works. And even if you never do sets of 15 or heavier again, you can get fucking jacked. If they showed him that and he added some quality size over the years, we could have been the fucking 225 on stage, same beautiful physique, even better lines. He could have been a fucking star. And yeah. but like he was like to him, it was like, OK, Ronnie was the man of the hour. And there's something to be said for that, because like you guys have been around long enough to where, you know, like. There's like the people everyone's talking about for a few months or a few years. And Ronnie was like, that was the Ronnie era. That was the peak of the Ronnie era because when he just came out, he was a genetic freak and everyone thought this was great. But 2003, Ronnie, that was like, what the fuck? I don't know if you guys remember. <laughs> what, checking what, is that? what is that? I literally Ronnie, like yeah. I was I was on a date with my girlfriend at the time and I came home. I was actually at her house and we like went downstairs like, hey, I got to check something online. I refreshed to get those prejudging pictures on Flex Magazine online. And because remember, they, they did Jay Cutler versus Gunter Schlierkamp versus Ronnie Coleman. It was supposed to be this trifecta of meeting of Godzilla, Mothra, and Rodan, or whatever the fuck the monster mm-hmm. is. And, uh, you know, one of the monsters. Who, who knows what they are at this point? The giant turtle guy. In any case, it turned out that Jay looked okay. Gunter Gamera. looked fine. Gamera, there you go. This. Fuck you. This fits like a glove. Um, both, okay, so, so. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not an OG book. So uh, it should have been. I so, can get acquitted. There you go. That's right. So Ronnie, I remember looking at those pictures of Ronnie. I just started laughing. I couldn't stop laughing 
because he had left everybody behind. And I remember they did a photo shoot a few months before. They were peak off season. Jay looked fluffy. Goudreau looked okay. Ronnie was 315 with clear veins and separations. And I was like, you motherfuckers better speed up the protocol because what the fuck? <laughs> and he just shut it all down. So for the next several years, training in many cases was like, well, what does your training look like on a scale of zero to compare to Ronnie Coleman? And everyone's trying to drag up there. And he had a lot of great features of his training. He trained every muscle twice a week, which is probably a good idea for many people, especially mm -hmm. intermediates. Mm -hmm. He did compound heavy basics, which was fucking mm -hmm. sweet. No mm -hmm. pansy fucking bullshit like we see a lot now. But like, you know, gee whiz, doubles and triples several weeks out from a show. I mean, first of all, let me be completely clear. At all is fucking stupid for a bodybuilder. If longevity yes. is your goal, you don't want to tear your yes. fucking pack off the bone. Tell people that. Three weeks time. before the show or five weeks, I mean, it was just unthinkable. Like, people did it and they got hurt. And, and then, you know, like... When Dorian was the shit, everyone tried hit. You know, like when Phil Heath was the shit, everyone was like, Phil Heath has amazing genetics. I don't know if anyone ever learned any training from Phil Heath, but nor does he does he really espouse it. That's kind of the, with Phil Heath. I, forgive me if I'm if I'm mistaken, but Phil Heath doesn't try to like put methods or descriptions onto some shit. Like his company until he sold it was called like gifted like gifted uh, yeah it's up like apparel. So it's, it's like yeah yeah it, it is it's like. Okay, well, I can't really have your gifts, but the cool thing is because he never really tried to sell his gifts, you know, like. Well, and he never did. He always he always gave credit to Honey. He's like, you know, I just I just do what Honey tells me to do. This works for me. It may not work for you, <laughs> yep. but that's that's yep. fine. You're you, and I'm I'm me, and that's it. You know what's trippy about Phil Heath too? Now that we're on the subject, I'd love to get your guys' take on it. Especially, I mean, he was a he was a champion well into the Instagram era. He is not someone who posts updates and physique pics almost at all. He's like a ghost, which is kind of trippy. Do you, what do you guys think? Just like, sorry if I'm interviewing you and out, out of place, but what, what do you guys think about that? Like, is it just a just personal preference? Like, if if you have an athlete you're coaching and he likes to do like you know tons of Instagram pics for the fans all the time, like getting sharper and sharper, or do you guys think there's like a real value in ghost prepping that like maybe we're missing? Is Instagram fucking that up? What do, what do you guys think? I think it depends on the person. Personal, my personally myself, I don't like to post more than a few times a week. Personally, because I like to just kind of keep some things under the table as far as what I'm doing, and I think I feel like it's a fucking distraction sometimes. Because oh yeah, you know you got to post something and you're waiting for all the likes, and I can just see people like doing and they're waiting and they're refresh, 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 yeah. and it's like I, I'll put something up and I'll the phone will go away and I'll I'll be off doing something for two hours and I'll come back and check it and I don't even look to see who actually liked or comment. If there's sure. a comment, I'll, I'll respond to it. If I feel like I want to, I think with Phil, most of it was, he couldn't play nice online. So he just decided to stop <laughs> because he was constantly in arguments with people online yeah. with, with trolls. So that might've been a, a reason for it. I, there's some real value in it though, right? There's a lot of real value in a, in a up and coming competitor or somebody who has good content like a John Jewett or so like you mentioned or something like that, posting frequently about things and putting out content where they can gain a following that can yeah. get them some business on it. But sure, people 90, want to know. 95% of the people out there on Instagram, it's just pure fucking shit. Yeah. And there's a 5% that have something good that everybody else can actually value from. But there's 95 percent of it is just fluff. It's just it's just garbage for eye candy, and there's really no no real value in any of it. Yeah, I mean, there's like multiple motivations that are overlapping as to why to post progress pics. I mean, yeah. like some categories I can think of is one, you are low self esteem and you want people to like your body. Easy. Two, that's number one. You want to have. <laughs> girls or if you're a girl boy or if you're homosexual same sex they didn't direct message you that they want you for one thing or another um three is you post content that's valuable but you have to show credibility like no one's going to take your advice that you know how to look good naked if you don't me <laughs> yeah um and then four is you wait until it's almost the show and you start throwing up incredible pictures out of nowhere to, fuck to drive up, to throw their cortisol up <laughs> that's me. over and you murder them on stage 
And so I think the ghost prepping value is if you're a serious competitor who isn't low self-esteem, doesn't need ass, and doesn't need money. The doesn't need money part, my Jewish sensibilities just hurt at even hearing. I'm like, what? <laughs> you would just walk over money in the road? Can't you bend down and pick it up? Uh, yeah. No, uh, honestly, I, I think that was a fucking brilliant kind of like dissection of the matter. I'll add oh. one more in. And this one's fucking lame, but I, and, and I know it has value for me. So maybe it's something you guys can, can jive with, but I follow, <laughs> okay. I follow a bunch of bodybuilders. Cause like, I can't always access porn. I'm just kidding. Uh, I follow, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the Instagram's just going to have to do it's one close. hand on the swiper, <laughs> one hand on the wiper. So uh, <laughs> what I do is I follow a lot of bodybuilders that I really like their physiques. And I just like, when I scroll, just like I'm taking a dump or it's like before training, I'm taking a dump. I take a lot of dumps and it's just kind of motivational to yeah. see guys fucking doing their shit. Like, like Nick Walker, I don't, yeah. Nick Walker's training seems fine out of personal philosophy. I've never like interacted with him as a human being. Like I've said a few things here and there back and forth in real life, but like, I don't know him. I don't follow him cause I'm his friend. Um, but like just seeing him with an arm pump. I'm just like, I'm trying to train arms right now. Like this right. is like the, and I don't think I'm going to look like him. I'm never going to look like him, but like just that it's like, it's like mortals looking at gods kind of thing. It's like one can dream and the having that can be two things. One, it can be toxic as fuck because it, me with a full arm pop is never going to be like Nick Walker. Sure. So some people get negative on themselves, put the fucking social media down. But for yeah. me, it's mostly positive where I'm like, if I get like, an amazing quad pump. I don't think I look like Tom Platt's, but if I scroll through Tom Platt's feed and I see his quads, it gets me itching to do the best for myself. You know sure. what I mean? Do you guys feel that at all? Like that's maybe another valid reason to yeah, post is, you know, people look up to you to some extent and you're like, Hey, this is a cool, most muscular I'm proud of. Maybe you motherfuckers could look at this and be like, damn, I'm going to go train chest. I don't know. Yeah. So it's, my Instagram feed is threefold. Because you were it's like you're saying it's so funny so i'm also from metro detroit i'm also short as fuck i'm also jewish bro so, what are you talking about i was yeah. i said i was i was how many of those things that i admit to these are rumors. <laughs> that, so i saw your most muscular when you were ready for the stage right before your most recent show and had the same basic uh, internal conflict as you have when you look at Nick Walker, whereas on one hand, you're motivated. On the other hand, I'm never going to look like that. And so therefore, whereas you don't see yourself that way, others do. Yeah. So it's the mirrors type of situation where you're a hall of mirrors and you're only looking in one direction. Yeah. 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 So, My Instagram is threefold. So it's, it's people I know. Actual right. human beings, you know, right? That's like human the tenth of my know. Instagram, right? Yeah. People I like, where I just like what I see. The content is good. It's the rock, or whatever, shit like right. that. Right, I like them, um, and then people I I follow because I want to learn something from them. I thought you were going to say people I hate. <laughs> no, because if I don't like you, you you have no no room in my life. I'm not one of these people that hates somebody and has to watch everything they do because I hate them. Yeah, that's I hate fucking them, weird. If I hate them, it's like. Blocked gun. We don't. I don't even need to. I don't even need to know you exist because my life will be much better if I didn't even know that you existed. So I no I negativity in this. Place. Right. I I try not to not to worry about what other people I don't like are doing. Um, but that being said, when it comes to me for for what I put on there, it's mostly. And here's where you where you said that you know you're fucking with people's head. I will. Most of my Instagram is going to be video content. Um. There might be some other stuff on there, like progress po photos in the off season, but that's what they make the close friends thing. So you can just show the people that you really give two fucks about and actually value their opinion on a, on a, you know, on a story feed. But most of my stuff on there is going to be some training video and that kind of stuff on there so that other people can see, because one, I coach other, other bodybuilders and, and, you know, competitors. So I, I want them to see what I'm doing so they get sure. the correct way to do shit. The way I sure. want them to do things on there as well. But also you're advertising for your services when you do that because, hey, this motherfucker actually might know what he's talking about, right? Look at him. 
But I'm not, I'm not, you know, that goes twofold. You've got the ones that train, that put training content on there, but they're in a stringer and they're jacked all the time. And they've literally lumped three weeks worth of, worth of time together to get a year's worth of content. Yeah. They just keep posting all year because they got to look their best because they only look like that for three weeks of the year. Me, I'll just throw it, you know, I'm not wearing a hoodie or a t-shirt or something in the off season. I'm just showing you my whole off season. This, and as we get closer to the show, I'm still covered up until all of a sudden it's like three weeks out and it's like, bang, oh shit, there's a progress picture in front of you that is for everybody to see now. Yeah. Now here's Keith at 210, you know, peeled and, and, and vascular and he's, he's, he's giving you a few shots of his, of his progress pictures. Oh, here's a video to go along with it. This is how, this is what I've been doing this off season to bring up this body part. This is what I've been doing. And you, and you post there. So now that's good content. Plus, you're fucking with anybody that knows you're doing the show. That's an extra, extra mean spirited right. thing at the end. I love it. It is. Oh, I mean, I don't. I have my moments. It's, it's a competitive edge. Is that mm-hmm. somebody's emotional fortitude is a factor that mm-hmm. how many people get scared, and if you can use fear as a weapon, then and it's an effective tool on and off stage. So that's totally true. Right now, I'm actually in uh, Orlando because Nationals is happening and our friend uh, Charlie is competing. Ooh. And Charlie, P.S., looks fucking absurd, like ridiculous. But he was following a couple folks just to see what they were doing, or this whole prep. And he's mentally, he's super solid, so it wasn't ever a problem. But Jared and I were like, dude, who gives a fuck? And he's like, oh, it's just curious. It's kind of cool. And I'm like sort of rooting for them and seeing everyone brings their A game. The two top guys he was following, uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos, whatever, Thomas. Carlos Thomas Jr. I would say Carl's Jr. And can you guys tell I just finished a diet? And then um, then there is uh, Justin Shear. Mm-hmm. And Charlie was like, man, these guys, man, they're going to go one and two for sure. It turns out they didn't make the super cutoff. They made the heavy cutoff. So like Justin Shear actually announced two weeks before he was like, I'm a heavyweight. I'm not a super. And right. then Carlos Thomas apparently just made the supers. He just weighed in. Oh, sorry. It's supers. He made the heavies. Charlie's not in the heavies. He's a super. So I almost want to be like, so Charlie, like, how's that motivation now? Are these guys even in your class? You, who, who the fuck is in your class even? I mean, he knows a few of the other guys. Right. But it's kind of cool. It never fucked with him. But it to me, it was kind of it like. It could. It could have fucked with him, yeah. And but he, but let's say there's an alternate universe in which he really was like sweating these guys. Yeah. In that alternate universe, as soon as they pulled out and or pulled out, this made a different weight class. He's, you know, he would feel kind of fucking like what? I was sweating these motherfuckers didn't show up. And I I told him at the beginning of prep like all their people that you don't know, random bodybuilders that post progress pics. You guys have been around the sport long enough. Not everyone's a fucking saint. Not everyone even likes the sport. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but this is his own admission. Flex Wheeler said that his coach would have to physically restrain him from driving to McDonald's. Physically restrain him from driving to McDonald's the week before his show. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not too worried about competing against a guy like that. I mean, he might beat me, but he didn't beat me. Do you feel me? Like, up here? Mm-hmm. Like, nah. So, he, used to, uh, he used to find the rappers underneath the uh, underneath the front seat of his car all the time. It's, cra- it's crazy. It's like, you know, you send your coach updates. You're like, I don't know. Diet's not really moving. Like, what diet, motherfucker? But <laughs> like, <McDonald's. laughs> like what, I, whatever I'm writing, you're not doing. But it, it's kind of a trip. People assume this constancy of the world, this linearity. Yeah. They assume, like, everyone's going to come in and shape. Everyone's going to do the show who says, see, in my experience, a third of the guys drop out. A third of the guys miss their peak. A third of the guys are addicted to heroin and don't even bodybuild anymore. Right. And then you got the guys that come through, and then you got dark horses you never even thought of. Like, right. Charlie didn't make the fucking Bodybuilders Without Borders, like, you know, nine Instagram plane top supers. He's going to be in that fucking call out, though, tomorrow. And some guys are going to sure. be like, what the fuck is that? Why the fuck? Who's this guy? Yeah. It's bullshit. Sure. And, and that happens you know. Everywhere. It happens regularly. So when you, if you're a person who likes to be in the mix, it's good to remember these things, I think. Like if you're a person who's competing and who likes to follow the other competitors, just remember nothing's guaranteed. Like someone can always come and upset the apple cart. And also these guys could not come through. So if you follow it and it gives you like a little bit of like a boxer's kind of like, all right, we're going to tussle. This is fun. Hey, that's great. But if you get in your head about it, if you're worried about what the other guy's doing, also it's not MMA. You don't get to punch him in the face. Like, right. Habib and Connor could hate each other because they literally get to settle it. 
You're not settling right. shit. You're in a fucking bikini in front of judges and a bunch of people in the audience who only came there to see their one grandson compete. They don't give a fuck about you. That's just what you are. Like, there's no battle. Nobody's going to war. So, like, if, if you really get in your head about, I'm going to fuck this guy up, like, no, you're not. Bodybuilding is illegal to fuck anyone up. You just do this, and the judges go, okay, you win. Like, if that's motivation mm-hmm. for you, sweet. Know what you're getting yourself into, I guess. Right. So, yeah, with well, that being said, let's let's talk some training. Because I yep. really enjoy talking training. <laughs> this is you this is stuff. I've... Who invented minimum effective volume and maximum recoverable volume. That yep. you're like, you are the Yoda of training, whether you oh, realize right. perceive outside your own head or not. So well, thank I mean, you so much. <laughs> the biggest question for me is what do you think about the big controversial tops topic of reps and reserve, TUT, and tempo. And I know that you, I know what you think, but I, I don't, our listeners don't know what you think. Yeah. You want me to just go down the list? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. So reps and reserve is just a way to try to see how far away from failure you are. And you can just not use them. You could go to failure all the time. And that's cool. But we know from some good research and a lot of practical experience that Training to failure, true failure, every single set is a really, really fatiguing and it's really stimulative too. So it'll get you jacked, but makes you real tired and beats you up a lot. So you have to deload and back off more often. If you train at an average of like two reps in reserve, then it turns out on average over the course of a mesocycle, you get almost the same stimulus as going to failure, but you actually get less fatigue substantially. There's an emotional fatigue that carries over when you really like get into like a machine press and you're like everything, this set is everything. Yeah, it'll stimulate muscle growth, but holy fuck, it drains you. I mean, you can only do that so many times. If you do two reps in reserve and you just try to beat last week's reps by one rep or add five pounds and get the same reps, and you just repeat that week after week after week, as soon as sooner or later you hit failure anyway, just trying to match your numbers. But a lot of that training for weeks has been submaximal, highly effective, it didn't drain the fuck out of you, so you could string together six good weeks of progression versus three and needing to deal them. So in my view, you can do pretty far from failure and have to do more volume to make up for it or have longer progressions. You can go real close to failure, fail all the time, have shorter progressions or do less volume. I think for most people, the beneficial ground mostly exists in that three, two, one reps in reserve zone. So I start all my mesocycles at three or four reps in reserve. I add five pounds and or a rep until I hit failure and I can't match my reps and then I'm like, it's fucking deload time. So that's the RIR. I think most people train, they don't realize that when they think they're training to failure, they're really training at a one RIR anyway. <laughs> or, or three, because they're just right. quit. They're like, ah, this right, is hard. Right. Oh, oh, it's starting to get hurt. It's starting to hurt a little bit. We're, we must be failing. Well, no, you probably could string together two more reps that are not going to be as explosive or perfect as, as you know, reps six, seven, and eight were, but nine and 10 you're probably going to get more out of that nine and 10 because it's really fucking hard, but you really could fail at 11. 11. And when I say failure for me, when I say failure, I can't get the bar to budge on my own anymore. It's either coming back or somebody has got to help me get that, get that's failure to me, right? That's, that's when you've had true actual failure beyond failure would be, well, you know, that's force reps negative somebody you know we're, we're drop setting or something or we're training with a rest pause that's what we've, we've hit beyond failure type because you've already failed once most people they get to positive failure in a rep where they get the geez, okay we're done that's a, yeah that's really one irr because you probably could get one more rep or a half a rep out of that too now you've actually gone to failure yeah right so when a lot of guys say oh failure training works great for me it's really one or two rir training that's working great right, for them exactly. just call it failure because exactly. they're not training hard enough Right. Uh, my definition of failure is if the rep's quality decreases, and that could be form or that could be velocity. So if I'm going to be doing explosive concentrics, if that explosion is more like a whimper, then to me that you've now failed to match the quality of the preceding rep, and you're now into a gray area of quality, and it's a quality. That's especially true when applied to like athletic context. So you're actually taking a grand view. Like if I'm doing box jumps, box jumps to failure means my like jumping mechanics suck. It doesn't mean I can't get on the box by any means necessary. <laughs> like 
that'd be really fucking stupid. Or like sprints to failure. Like nobody sprints to failure. You, you consider it a done workout when your last velocity recording was like 90% or 89% of your peak right. velocity. And you're like, well, we're not here training sprints anymore. We're going to be running, but that's training totally different pathways. But I think for me to get real specific in the context of muscle growth training, failure is technical failure. So when you can no longer lift the weight concentrically, move it on your own with good technique. Because if you have to do this and it goes, it's like, hey, yeah, how many benches count. was that? They're like 10. It was like, no, it was nine benches and one something else that was fucking stupid and you should have done it. You're using all rear delt, yeah, or all, for all front delt to get it up. <laughs> all anything, your hips or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the next topic was time under tension. Yep. Correct. Yeah. So technically speaking, your muscles can't count reps. They generally uh, produce tension for a certain amount of time. And that's some total amount of tension produced over time. The greater the time, the greater the tension. The more the molecular signaling pathways that actually cause growth are just turned on. It's like a dimmer switch. And it's just turned on more and more and more. So in that sense, when people say it's all about TUT, it's all about time under tension, they're not completely wrong. Because exposing muscle to a huge amount of tension for longer and longer and longer is what causes hypertrophic mechanisms to activate. And they scale, the more they activate, you know, up until a point, the more time you place the muscle under tension, the more it grows. However, time under tension from that theoretical perspective is super cool and makes a lot of sense. It can be abused and it almost always is when motherfuckers are trying to take shortcuts. So they'll do some stupid technique where they're just like right here and they're doing dumbbells like this and they're barely moving at all. And someone's like, dude, what are you doing? And they're a TUT bro, time under tension. That's nice. Certainly those muscles are under tension for the amount of time. However, if you look at the research on how much muscle growth isometrics cause, it's not as much as concentrics and eccentrics. Right. In addition to that, especially long muscle lengths, full range of motion training works better than partials. Also, if you want to count your progression and say, okay, I got 10 reps last week, got 11 this week. I don't know how the fuck you do that with TUT. At some point you just decide to quit. So from a progression tracking from a full range of motion and, and putting the muscle through using all of its motor units instead of just some when you're over here uh, and from proper technique and everything and the fact that concentrics and eccentrics grow tons more muscle than just isometrics, you can't just use time under tension as an excuse to get under some dumbbells or barbells and just do this like convulsion bullshit with no range of motion. So if we say, okay, time under tension is important, but the way we're going to proxy how much time we spend under tension is how many sets and reps we do with proper cadence, then all of a sudden we get all the benefits of TUT, but because we say they're proper sets and reps, we get all the benefits of range of motion, full muscle activation, eccentric, concentric phase, and that way we're just doing good fucking training. So when someone says, look, time under tension is fundamentally what causes growth, agreed. But when they use time under tension to get away from the ranges of motion that are proper, then I'm like, look, motherfucker, you know, time under tension is just some scientific bullshit you found out yesterday so you could justify your bitch ass having to not squat all the way down. <laughs> like, you were going to use any justification you could or no justification at all. You were never going to squat low because you're a fucking pussy and that's just that's your shit. So you don't have to say TUT, just squat all the way down, goddammit, and you'll get fucking huge. You could say anything or nothing at all after that. But if you got to say TUT to justify bullshit training, sweet, you're the fucking man. TUT it is, bro. Dorian had it right. I don't know. Whatever meme you want to insert into that shit. Well, the funny thing is, is um, you just how about you try posing, and then you got your isometric contraction for and you you hold your attention. Seconds, <laughs> and next week you hold your poses for twenty seconds. Yeah. And next week you're you're gonna get huge. Progressive resistance and isometric time under tension training. You just oh. don't call it posing. Think about this; it's perfect specificity too, because you're literally training for exactly the thing you're going to be doing, which is posing. Did you guys? Right. We just start a new system of training, the posing system. You got training, you just pose all the time. We, you were saying that with the time under tension, and you're and, and you're right. It just, I mean, theoretically, it is correct that putting a muscle under tension for longer periods of time is going to help it grow. But here's the problem with that: is people misconstrue that they still don't load the muscle. They don't oh, put yeah, how enough much tension, tension <laughs> on on it to actually matter. It also it also matters what muscle fibers you're actually tapping into when you do that. If we're typing into all type one fibers because you've got a 20-pound fucking dumbbell that you're trying to do presses with, 
Sure, but those are also the smallest fibers that you that the muscle has, yeah. and the growth is going to be very extremely limited in how big they can get. You want to get muscle to grow, you need to tap into type two fibers, which means you need to actually put it under a load that it's not used to. You still have to put it under a load and under enough tension so that the time under that tension makes the muscle grow. And I think people miss, like you said, with the little with this, that's great if you've already done full range and failed, and now we're just trying to fatigue that muscle just a little bit more and train a little past sure. failure. Sure. sure, that's a great technique to use every now and again. But just doing this bullshit right here, if this is your entire range of motion is moving the bar that far, and you're only it doing it with 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 fifty percent of the load that you should be using, you're not going to get it. You're going to be very limited to what you're going to grow. Yeah, well, it's a lot of tut for not a lot of good reason. <laughs> <laughs> with no, no substance. A subcategory, which is Brad Schoenfeld's work, showing that 30% of a one rep max is effective if taken to failure versus, let's say, 80%, which was also in the same study to be considered to be as effective. I'm sure you have an opinion about using 30% versus 80% and everything in between. I do, and I think that at least in the in the long, a short and medium term, weeks and months, Training close to 30% 1RM is going to produce very similar, if not identical, results for muscle growth. That is, you know, if you're training all the way, uh, you know, to failure with 80% 1RM. However, there are, there are two things there. One, we're not sure if it produces the same amount of long-term hypertrophy. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Another problem is training very close to failure with 30% of your 1 rep max is so fucking painful and difficult that the people in that study that did it, they have the benefit of having researchers literally yell at them every set, push them into crazy psychotic exertions. All, almost all these studies, they just train a few muscle groups, not the whole body. It's like three mm -hmm. days a week. If you have to train your whole body and motivate yourself, the pain of getting close to failure on a 30% 1RM lift is awful that acid accumulation in your muscles is terrible it's the fucking worst it's not a sustainable way of training for many people mm -hmm. so if most people especially the ones that use excuses like tut when they say oh it's just time under tension no big deal they'll take a 30 rm weight and they'll stop five reps short of failure which means they get almost you know well not so very small fraction of potential benefit because most of that benefit is going to come in those last few reps when the faster fibers really start to turn out even more. Now, they're on the whole time. They're getting some stimulus, but it's just not the same. Yeah. So yeah. if you really want to train with much lighter weights and say time under tension, you had better be getting close to failure on those light weights. If you're not, you can say anything you want in this world, but it might not actually be like the you're not getting the hypertrophy that you think you're getting mm -hmm. because someone can can ask you a simple question. Is your training ultra challenging? If the answer is yes, you're doing mostly everything you can to grow. If the answer is like, eh, then, you know, you can say TUT all you want, but you're not going to get very jacked doing it. The last question was the tempo, how you feel about the specific cadence. Like, let's say a four second eccentric, two second contraction, two second stretch, a one over infinity concentric phase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so how do I answer this best? There is, there's a good body of literature, uh, again, summarized by the great Brad Schoenfeld, that shows that anything between like roughly around nine seconds of total rep time is fine. So three second eccentric, three second pause at the bottom, three second concentric, add it together is nine seconds. That's totally fine. And if your concentric is a little longer and eccentric and pause are shorter, that's probably totally fine. The real reason that's probably totally fine is to get a decent number of reps, let's say 10 reps, nine seconds each rep, the load is going to be a load you can lift through a full range of motion for 90 seconds straight, which is like, that's a lot of seconds. I mean, that's a minute and a half. Most of my best hypertrophy sets take between 30 seconds 
and a minute and a half. And a minute and a half is on the very long end, mm -hmm. which makes sense that if you're lifting a weight, you can lift for two minutes straight. Like if you're doing 18 second eccentrics, it's not the 18 second eccentric that's the problem. It's the fact that you are lifting a weight that is so light that it's probably less than 30% of your 1RM. Yeah. And then you're not going to get the best growth. That being said, that's the first level of analysis. The second level is uh, a bit deeper and a bit better. It is this. Don't do anything stupid like losing way too light of weights and thus super crazy eccentric and concentric, you know, 12 seconds per rep. Now, now that we know not to do that, we can go back into this range of three seconds or two seconds and nine seconds and see, well, where is good here? And that's what comes down to a couple of things. One, if you completely let the eccentric drop in your eccentric phase, isn't a second, it's less. You don't have a whole lot of muscle activation. You're missing a very productive part of the movement. It's been shown, at least in animal data, that isometric, concentric, and eccentric, the muscle growth is slightly different in the pathways that it uses to grow. So missing a whole phase is probably fucking stupid. Missing the eccentric phase, if, if I had to pick one phase that probably grew a little bit more muscle than the others, it's the eccentric phase. It's the slow lowering. Mm -hmm. And, and what, but what, what are most guys really concerned about? How many reps can I get with 100-pound dumbbells? Well, they miss the eccentric phase altogether because they're doing it like CrossFitters. The thing is, CrossFitters are literally judged in their sport by how many reps they can do with hundreds. They're doing it right. They don't need an eccentric phase. Mr. Bodybuilder over here needs that eccentric phase to get his best growth. So I would say if you're controlling the eccentric, it can still be a second, but it's like like that second where you're slowing down the weight. You can feel it in the muscles. You're doing a good job. So a tempo, if you control the eccentric, if you take a slight pause, there's pluses and minuses. Sometimes it can let you rearrange your technique. Sometimes if you pause at the bottom, you get more time under a big stretch, which is really stimulative. And it can keep you safer because if you, you know, a lot of guys say barbell benching fucks with my shoulders. I don't want to tear a pec. Start pausing your benches for two seconds. They're like, well, I can't lift as much weight. Well, no shit. You think it wasn't the weight that was hurting you, dumb motherfucker? And all of a sudden, they're lifting a lot less weight, but they're pausing every rep. And they're like, dude, chest is fucking being blown up for barbell bench. My shoulders aren't hurt. Like, yeah, because your shoulders are hurting from you doing 400, not 315. You should have never been doing 400 because you're not a fucking power lifter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So sometimes we could do the, the concentrics and pauses. Some guys like to do a fast concentric. That research has been studied pretty well. There's no definitive answer how fast concentrics grow more muscle than slow ones, uh, which is to say in some individuals, there might be an advantage. Overall, there may be an advantage. We just know it's not massive. Like if you see a guy doing pretty slow concentrics, you're not going to look at him and be like, idiot, he's not growing any muscle. You could be like, eh, you know, uh, you know, what he's doing probably works pretty well. What I like to do by default is I like to control every eccentric for like two or three seconds usually, but not always. Depends on the movement too. Two or three second eccentric on a bicep curl is forever. Two or three second eccentric <laughs> on, a, on a squat could be like not enough, you know, because there's a lot of distance you're covering. Yeah. So I like to control the eccentric generally two to three seconds, depending on the movement. I like to usually take a pause, but not always, especially if it's an exercise like for quads or for chest, something that tears. I like to take a fucking pause because I like to reduce the load and get the good stretch instead of bouncing out and fucking my shit up. And then I like to generally either cap my concentric speed at a certain speed just for good technique or do as high of a velocity as I can. It depends on the movement. Like for pull downs, I like to do a high velocity because I won't be able to touch my chest to count how many reps I'm doing unless I really pull it down hard. Because if you pull the pull down here, mechanically it's not leveraged well here, you're gonna be like, I can't go anymore. But if you start out with a good velocity, you can really do the same with hamstring curls. Mm -hmm. But you know, with something like uh, Smith machine bench pressing, I don't think there's a huge upside with me throwing the fucking bar off my chest. I certainly don't want to get hurt. So I'll, what I'll do is all of my concentric reps will look the same because I'm capping it at a certain velocity. And then when I get really, really close to failure, they start to slow down for like a rep or two because mm -hmm. I was getting close to failure the whole time, but you couldn't see it in the velocity because I intentionally capped the velocity submaximal. So that's kind of my approach. But generally speaking, I'd say is don't overthink tempo as long as you're milking the eccentric and staying safe and not doing anything wacky like doing a nine second concentric all the it's all good answers for what works for you yep got it That's so it factors into time under tension so the big limiter in time under tension is you need reps to be able to have progressive resistance otherwise you really can't progress time under tension likewise my experience with very strict tempo is you're so 
focused on concentrating on the tempo, you're not concentrating on the lift, you're not feeling the muscle. That, okay, the fact that you said that, I'm really thankful you said that because it needs to be heard. Um, it's not something I've spoken a lot at length about, but it's one of the million things in, in the practice that pisses me off at least a little. It's not so common right now in bodybuilding. It's real common in powerlifting. Um, people think there's some magic to these tempo things. Like they'll see me do bent rows and they're like, Dr. Mike, are you doing a two, one, one tempo? I'm like, what the fuck does that even mean? What? And they're like, <laughs> well, okay, it's concentric, isometric, eccentric. Got it. And I'm like, no, man, I don't count seconds. I fucking, uh, when I do bent rows, I fucking control the eccentric in a big ass stretch, pull nice and hard to touch my tummy and repeat. That's it. How many fucking seconds that takes. Like you said, I see a lot of guys getting carried away with counting shit. And a lot of guys are, man, another thing is people are like, you know, what cues do you use for stiff legged deadlifts? And I'm like, tummy out, chest up, butt back, knee straight. And they're like, okay, what other cues? Because I'm trying to think about it when I do it. And I'm like, up, 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 up. You can use any cues you want. I gave you the three or four most simple ones. After you know the cues, not think about them, you know what they mean. Like, I know chest up means this. It doesn't mean this. I know what the cues mean. I know what butt back means. I know what straight knees are. You don't think about cues anymore. You think about, am I feeling my fucking hamstrings get stretched and torn apart at the bottom? If the answer is no, all the cues you're doing are either wrong or not enough. If you lift your chest more and you're like, oh, shit, I feel my hams. Uh -huh. That's what we're talking about. People get too carried away with counting specific tempos, really on the word use of a specific cue, it's all in the spirit of the thing. And the thing is, are you feeling a shitload of tension and stretch and metabolite throughput through the target muscle? Mm -hmm. Because if you show me you're doing an exercise, I'm like, that's an interesting way to do that. I'll ask you just one question, two questions. One, do you feel that in your pecs? And two, how does it feel on your joints? And if you're like, dude, my joints feel amazing. I get the fucking gnarliest pec burn and pump ever. What am I going to say that you're Keep wrong? Doing it. <laughs> Keep doing Keep it. Doing now, it. I could say, hey, try it this other way and see if it's even better. Maybe I'm right. But I sure as hell don't have a problem with it. The problem I have, and I'm sure you guys see this too, is you go to gyms anywhere in the world and there's people working out. And you know for a fact, they don't feel shit anywhere. And they're like, hey, what do you think of my technique? And you're like, well, and externally it looks okay. But let me give you a couple tips and try to really feel your back open and close. And they're like, oh, does this mean I haven't grown my back as much as I could have in this last year? It's like, yes, that is correct answer. Yeah. I see that a lot with uh, with people who squat, especially in a bench press. Those are the two biggest ones where I see that, where you look at them and it's like, okay, there is absolutely zero load on a muscle anywhere. This is all joint. You've got to just be wrecked at all points in time of trying to do this. And it'll be exactly what you said, where they're using more inertia than they're using actual muscle, you know, muscle tension to actually grow the muscle. And it's like the bench press, you're bouncing out of the bottom, right? Oh, yeah. Bouncing off their chest. And they wonder why their fucking elbows and their shoulders hurt all the time. Or in a squat, my favorite one, where they literally just fall to the bottom. Oh my and god! They fall to the point. They fall to the bottom of the point where their hamstrings and their and their ass touch each other, and then they 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 literally bounce off the bottom out. And I'm like, your knees are fucked. Your hips are fucked. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, also like your quads. Your, at least you could get some quad growth out of it, but you're literally missing the most important part. Like another thing to me that jumps out is when people do like hack squats and they intentionally cut the range of motion. I'm like, have you ever done a hack squat to the point where everything touches at the bottom and you physically feel your quads? Like you've hit quote unquote bottom. You let your hips sink a little further and the front top of your quads is physically feels like it's being pulled apart. Like, yeah. Where do you think growth comes from? Why would you miss out on that part of it? And a lot of things is you can't hack squat a lot. If you start sinking them in, you got to, oh, I have to hack squat six plates. Now you hack squat four plates, you dumb asshole. And then when you start controlling the eccentric, like you were talking about, instead of folding into the squat, you lower slowly and you push your knees forward gently so that the quads take the load the whole time. Now you're using three plates. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. Good news. Three plates isn't going to fuck your shit up. If you've been surviving six plates, your joints are going to be great forever. Yeah. And also, if you physically tell me, 
dude, I actually can feel my quads more on this. Well, guess what? You're getting at least the same quad hypertrophy as you do from six plates, from three plates. So then we only have one thing left on the table before you say, well, this is actually the best way to train. It is, well, I don't feel like six, three plates is something that imp impresses who? You, other guys <laughs> on fucking Instagram, hoes, who <laughs> talk about what you fucking, what you lift on a machine right. at all. So it's, yeah. it's just ego. You using three less plates and doing it the proper way created more mechanical tension, which means more growth. That's You're welcome. welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Put on this exact thing. Today, I saw my quads in a particular mirror that I haven't seen in a while. And I was like, God damn, I actually have like keeps quad sweep. Not <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the biggest change is instead of nine plates on the half spot bouncing, I'm actually three, four plates on the hack squat, and I'll pause for two seconds. Oh. And then come up a four second eccentric, pause for two seconds at the bottom. And then it's an infinite rest pause where you do rest pauses until you can't get a single rep. And I remember, like, my first time I did it, I got one set and one extra set, like six reps on the extra set, and threw up for like yeah. half an hour. And then the second time I got an eight minute set. It was, it was, I was in there for eight minutes. Did eight your feet hurt after that? What actually happens is I start regenerating ATP faster. So I go like 10 reps, six reps, five yes. reps, four reps, four reps, five reps, six reps. I'm like, well, I'm going to be for all fucking day. I got the rest of my life to train, you know. How, that, big of a pump, how big of a pump did you get from that? I think I sweated it out. I think I dehydrated faster than I pumped. But, <laughs> but it's, you know, you wring your shirt out. But it's one of those things where training like a pussy actually works really well. And, you know, like I'm sleeping 12 to 15 hours sometimes after those leg days. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me you wake up to eat at least one of those. No, I don't. And that's part of the problem is I have 5,000 calories a day I have to eat. It's very hard to get it in because it's all clean food. Because you're so eating every hour. <laughs> I just sit there. Like this bowl, I filled it to the top. I saw that. Crispy rice, and then I poured in um, water and whey protein, basically. So it's like 75 grams of protein and 200 carbs. You're yeah. really selling the lifestyle here. <laughs> right. So when you're talking with, with, <laughs> you're talking with, a, hack, with a hack squat there, right, and, and sinking it all the way down, um, and I've actually shown this to people on the back and I actually had the gym that one of the gyms that I train at, I had them build a platform for the hack squat that sits on. So the, the, the plate is like this. It sits on like this yes. so that I can get my toes or just the only yes. thing is touching the original and yes. my feet are flat just so I can get my knees all the way forward. Yes. And I, I had to warn some people. I was like, that's a great thing to do, but you're going to, whatever you use, you're going to die take at least 80% of the weight off of what you normally yeah. use. And yeah. I promise you, your quads will never hurt worse than they do. And the further up the platform you can get your, or down, you can get your feet on this, on this extension, the better off you're going to be. And your knees are going to, you would think they're going to cause a lot more shear, but because the load is going to have to be a lot less, it's not going to hurt. And you're literally the, it's almost like doing, if you do them correctly, it's like doing the Tom Platt's, uh, sissy squat, hack yeah. squat, because that's how I, that's how I had to make it. Cause I gave him the angles and everything and the disc that I needed to, to in order to do. Cause I used to just stack plates up on the bottom of it. And put, so to get my feet on a, on an incline there, so I could just get my toes down and do hack squat. So I had to make the platform and, and put, uh, put grading and stuff on it. So you would, you know, the no slip, so you couldn't slide your feet, couldn't slide off of it. And I'll tell you what, I'll come back to that every couple of weeks and do that. And when I do, it's, Count to four in your head, basically the front during your warm up, so you know the tempo that you want to hit. That's uh -huh. where that's where the counting comes in. Do it on uh -huh. your warm up, so it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, right? yeah, You're just sure, trying to get everything. Sure. Then you gotta get an idea how slow do I need to descend on this set? That's so I'm yeah. getting in the. I'm it becomes the natural order. rhythm, right? Get down, so I'm about four count to the bottom. Hold that stretch until under stretch load until it becomes excruciating, and then explode with everything you have back out. That's Go ahead and try try to get six reps like that. Have fun. Yeah, it's awful. It's a forty. It's a forty-five like second set under a good amount of load. It's still, but I think people miss the boat on stretch loading a muscle. 
a muscle under under tension when it's in a fully lengthened position under load is going to have to generate a lot more force to come back out of that to, yeah. to you know to shorten back up again. It's also miserable. Like intuitively, yeah. if you knew nothing about the science, you'd be like, I don't know, man, this hurts so goddamn much. It's got to be doing something. <laughs> right. And it's not even like it hurts like the joint or it hurts your soul. It hurts your soul, too. But it hurts your it, soul. It hurts the fucking muscle. Like mm-hmm. all the bullshit like training we do, when we get pros on, on our uh, YouTube and we run them through workouts. You know, I've never heard someone be like, yeah, this is pretty good. We usually teach them all these techniques and they look at us after like two sets of hack squats or leg presses and they're like, I'm like, I, I do a joke question, which I know is a joke. I'm like, do you feel that in your quads? They're like, <laughs> what? I'm throwing up blood from my quads right now. I'm so pumped I can't get into this machine anymore. What do you think? And I'm like, I knew you felt it in your quads. I just want to make sure. Because at the end of the day, whatever kind of training you're into, if you have a lot of joint stress and your target muscle doesn't seem beat up, you, you got to ask the question of what the fuck you're doing. And right. that and that is the thing that where individualization comes into play. Like, uh you know like barbell curls guys will be like barbell curls is a secret to size like what if just my wrists hurt when i do them what are you gonna say like i don't get size anymore what if i try an easy curl bar and like then my wrists don't hurt then i can curl and my muscles feel great my wrists feel okay are you gonna say like no man fuck that like i remember um uh for a while until i got so big that i actually can't grab an easy curl bar and do rows with anymore (laughs) um uh when i used to do underhand easy curl rows people would be like oh man that's dorian's shit like, why don't you do them with a straight bar like Dorian did? And I just, like, don't want to insult Dorian Yates, but I'm going to be like, who the fuck has the wrist mobility to do underhand straight bar curls? Like, he's got a goddamn gift from God to do that shit. Why the fuck he would you tore, do that? He also tore his bicep Everything. doing it. <laughs> right. Oops. <laughs> That's why he tore his bicep and had to retire in <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's that lesson, right? But it's just like, <laughs> it, and people are so worried about the external stuff. Like, what do you do this? What about that? What's the right technique? Look, if you can feel your muscles stretching painfully, filling with blood, getting a ton of acid in it, feel the tension, and afterwards, you, every set you do, you get a bigger and bigger pump. Man, you know, that can't You're be too right wrong of an answer. No. It can't be too wrong. And then, like, people get, you know, wigged out on the particulars. Here's another thing that pisses me off. I'll do one mesocycle of something, like six, five weeks of training, and every Wednesday, I do a straight bar pull down. And some motherfucker will always comment. It's all in good fun. We're just having fun. I'm not really pissed at this person. But they'll be like, so I notice you prefer the straight bar over insert whatever favorite bar they like. What's the reasoning for that? And I'm like, what the fuck? What do you mean prefer? Like, I just did it for five weeks. And then the next week, just randomly, I'll do the whatever mag grip bar that they seem to like. And they're like, hey, how are you liking those mag grips? I'm like, motherfucker, I'm 37 years old. I've been around for 15 fucking years of mag grips. I use them a trillion times. I didn't just discover the shit. It's crazy how much people think like the one thing they see one fucking Instagram video of you doing or you training for five weeks, like that's the answer. Can you imagine, like, this is the same kind of questions we get from like people when we go out to eat. Like you guys have been out to eat with regular people, like your wives or whatever, invite their friends and that you order pasta. It's like a cheat meal. And they're like, so pasta, that's the thing. That's how you get big. Like, bitch, you see me eat one meal. This is clearly the answer. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, what are you talking about? Like. Like you see a race car driver wiping his tires right to left, and you're like, it's that's the right to left. That's how the car is fast. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I didn't even know it was wiping right to left. It could have been left to right. I'm not even paying attention. I'm listening to music. Right. It doesn't matter which way you wipe. So it's kind of crazy. People get caught in on this like real minute bullshit. And I totally get it. It's a fair question. But the answer has to be like, hey, there's this thing. There's a general exercise selection pool, which is good exercises. You take that and you filter it through your individual needs at the time and individual limitations. Mm-hmm. Once you do that, you still have a bunch of exercises that are valid. And then that's just variation. It's like, well, do you eat steak, chicken? Do you eat pasta or rice? Like, well, I eat both. I eat sometimes mixed together. It's all right answers. Then there's not like, can you imagine if like in nutrition it worked the same way as people think it does in training? You like look at Phil Heath's physique. You're like, that's a rice physique, bro. Some other guy comes out fat. He's like, too much pasta. That's what did it in. Like, (laughs) what? Like, that's not a thing. There's tons of variants, tons of right answers. If your muscles aren't getting stimulated, if your joints aren't getting fucked up, you're probably onto the right shit. It might yeah. not be the optimal shit, but it's not that far off. No, no. At, at that point, you you take what you're doing and you fine tune it to what has already been working for you. Maybe to stimulate a one percent of extra growth throughout the entire year. Whereas, hey, like you said, if using a straight bar is here has been good for you, but you realize that when you turn your hands inward you get more tension on the lats than less yep. on, on the bicep than, and you like it, 
then fucking keep doing it. Yeah, I don't have to tell you it's approved <laughs> or whatever. Like, right. and that's the thing. Like, you, some exercises people say, "Oh, well, this exercise doesn't actually train that muscle group." And someone will respond, "Like, why does that one muscle group pump up like crazy for me and get sore?" That that's being trained. I don't know what to fucking tell you. That's being yeah. trained. Like, your body type like, and the way the way it, the way it, it reacts right. through that range right. of motion. Right. If someone's like, "Well, my calves get sore hack squatting," are you? Do you think they're growing? I'll be like, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. When does something get consistently sore and actually recovers and it doesn't does not grow? I'm not aware of that sort of thing. And as a matter of fact, people who have small muscle groups that don't tend to respond well probably have trouble getting them sore. Do you guys ever notice that? Like the precisely the muscle groups in your body that you want to bring up but are stubborn, it takes a million sets to get them to feel fucking anything. You're like, mm -hmm. my rear delts or whatever, as an example, my rear delts are fine, but like people have trouble with rear delts. They're like I can't get a pump. I can't feel tension in them. I can't fucking get sore. I'm like that's, that's not a good deal. You know, like you got to find some exercises that hit you some way, check some of those boxes, then you'll start growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's 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 most prevalent with people with uh, with with their limbs, right? With their their legs and with their arms, and a lot of time they end up feeling the, they feel it feel it someplace else, like in the joint, and they don't have oh, to yeah. feel it in the muscle somewhere. And it's just the way they're loading it, and the type of and and the amount of load that they're using that they can't actually focus in on using the muscle instead. And a lot of times too, there might be some injuries involved, right? Look, if you've got fucked up shoulders, doing a bench press on a certain angle might not be the, the way you have to find the correct angle to, gotcha. to actually be able to stimulate the pec. Otherwise gotcha. it's going to continue to hit you in the joint. You're going to feel the front delt. You're going to feel that the triceps going to take over because it's making up for, you know, the fact that your shoulder isn't actually able to stabilize the load and the tricep takes over. Well, you got big fucking triceps, but you got a little pigeon chest like this. hundred percent. The you worst know? is when guys who have been hurt, uh, keep trying to come back like moths to the light to a movements that they used to do before they got hurt and it always just re hurts them. And they're like, dude, in powerlifting, I get it. If you can't low bar squat, like you're fucking done because that's the whole goddamn sport. It's a, three, a third of the sport. In in bodybuilding, the judges will never look at your legs and be like, eh, he doesn't do squats, like mark it off. If your legs look good, <laughs> they don't care. So if you have, find a way, to, it's 10 other machines in the gym and you get an unbelievable quad workouts, mm -hmm. but you haven't been squatting lately, and you're like, oh man, I need to squat. Like, all right, go home, go ahead, break in half. And this is coming from me. I love squatting. Squatting fits my body incredibly well. But like, if an exercise doesn't fit, there's so many other options. Stop beating yourself up with this idea of must have exercises. Like, big, big legs, you got to squat, like, or hack squat, or leg press, or lunges. There's like a ton of other answers. Now, squatting mm -hmm. helps. But if the trade off for you is like, every time you squat, you get a fucking re herniated spinal disc and you're in bed for three weeks. What the fuck are you doing? Stop doing shit like that. People do that all the time. Yeah, I found I found out a long time ago after I got to a certain point, squatting didn't load my quads anymore the way I wanted to, just doing a regular, you know, high bar squat that I needed to either do a front squat, which okay, now I'm limited in how much load I can use because it's choking the piss out of me. Yes, sucking so, up your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And I have and I have I've torn this rotator cuff and I've torn this pec. So Okay. That's not that's not an option anymore. But a safety bar squat works really really well because it sits out in front of me and, and naturally loads me towards the front. Yep. And then if I lean forward even further and put my hands on the rack for balance, now it really loads the front of sure. the quad and I and I and I can elevate the heels a little bit with a plate or something. Now I've, I'm onto something completely new, and now I can continue squatting. Whereas it's actually doing something for me, we're putting the bar on my back and just going up and down with 600 pounds was doing jack shit for me other than Absolutely. hurting my knees at some point and pumping my lower back because of the amount of weight and load that's on it. But but if you were dumber, you would say shit like, I don't fucking squat. I don't care what it does to my knees. And that's when you start wrapping the knees up. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and at the same time, well, well, I don't have a safe, I don't have a safety squat bar. Okay. Do you have a hack squat? Because yeah. it's going to load the quads very, very similar, especially when you place your feet properly. Find the foot placement and go do those. Like yeah, there's other machines alternatives to doing it. Right. Do you have any machine ever created ever for legs? Like, no. Try okay, that. well, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Try that. All you have is a squat rack. Well, you're pretty much fucked. Start lunging. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Guys, I got to get going here in a, sure, about a absolutely. minute or so. Well, it was a pleasure. Question. Go ahead. So, um, I noticed you train a crack in uh, Novi sometimes. Is that a okay. habitual thing? So my wife and I moved to Brighton, Michigan, and we started training at Crocs in Novi and I actually trained with Janae like in jiu-jitsu. And um, we have since installed a home gym 
Renaissance okay. gym. And now we train there and we just like hang with Janae for free time. Like we're going to hang with her in a, in a few weeks. When we get back from our holiday travels. I will say ever since I left that gym a few months ago, Janae's gotten like 10 times more awesome equipment. And I was like, God damn it. Why didn't you have any this shit when I was here? <laughs> so it's a fucking better gym than ever. And if I didn't have my own home gym, I would absolutely continue to train there. All right. So I was going to say, if you're doing that YouTube thing where you take a pro and you make them puke blood into a bucket or something, I sign up for the bucket. So if you ever need a victim, then I'm happy to be on the show and be humiliated. I'm in Grand Rapids. It's it, it's two and a half hours for me. <laughs> well, fuck. Hey, fellas, hit me up. Hit me up, and yeah. we'll do a fucking video. We'll we'll Sweet. do legs together or some shit I, like that. Yeah. It, it's Ten minutes from Crocs. I used to go there before um, my pro debut. Yeah. You just signed. You just signed your own death warrant. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy dying. Excellent. There's going to be a lot of dying. Um, guys, I'm going to drop out. Thank you so right, much man. for having me on. Hey, I'll, thanks, uh, I'll chat with you we'll later. You Let again. me know. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Well, that was fun. Yeah, I'll 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 sign my death warrant. I I enjoy those. Those those videos are my favorite. When he takes the fucking power lifters and puts them through a bodybuilding workout, and they literally get one exercise in and they're writhing around the floor in pain. <laughs> those are my favorite ones. Was I better about not fangirling than I have been in the past? Yes, like, you were. You were. Yeah, I didn't yeah. make. Well, you didn't. You didn't hit on him. So there. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Always off camera. So how you doing? That was funny though. He's like, "Can I swear?" Then forty percent work. Like that's the only reason anybody watches this shit is because we cuss a lot. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so. Hey. Did you notice on the, the most recent bro chat how they finally talked about politics with the Australia um, concentration camps and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And it's like how like it that was the straw that broke Buat's back. <laughs> you know, it's like that that was what did it. It was like he's like enough's enough. I can't keep my mouth shut anymore about this. And right. everybody's ready to sound off because like nobody he just keeps it so clean. And that's not a clean show, but he's got like one. He'll have racism and shit talk every episode, but he won't talk about politics. Well, because that's that's not going to get you. That's not going to get you filtered off of YouTube. That's why, right? You can't talk. There's two things you really can't talk about. You can't talk politics, and you can't talk the virus. Otherwise, you're going to end up with you're going to end up getting demonetized. So, yeah. I mean, that's just oh. that's just to me. As much as probably like to talk about it, he's been smart not to because. And they'll even say, guys, we can't talk politics on here. We can't talk politics because I don't want to get demonetized. He's better off putting a fucking video up of somebody else's shit and playing it and playing music in the background than he <laughs> is talking politics at this point. So, so what's new, Todd? Oh, I, you know, I got a cold. Everyone else has COVID, but I got tested three times. But it, it's like, like when you get a cold, it was just like, 12 to 15 hours of sleeping. It's been like a week. I'm still having a hard time breathing, even though I don't really have any other symptoms. Mm -hmm. but it's not like when I had COVID in March, but it's still, it's not as bad as other colds I've had, but it really has gotten in the way of me getting in the 5,000 calories. And mm -hmm. thus, it's like, luckily I've been able to hold steady at 201 the whole time. Normally, I'd lose like 10 pounds if I get sick. I look flat today, but I look sick. I have been pushing as much food as humanly possible and to the point where I went and bought a blender so I can start toddling my chicken shakes if I, if necessary because I, I, I can't physically get any more fucking food in. <laughs> well, what I found was it's the price of protein did not go up, but the price, price of meat did. And kind of and everything so that blending chicken would be more expensive than just using whey isolate or right and that's that's what i ended up doing as i got that and i'm like i can't bring myself to do that so i'll just eat as much chicken as i possibly can and if there's still protein left that i can't like that i can't get in if that increases i'll just blend up some whey with something 
that taste really good, you know, like little Splenda in there and some ice and some almond milk or something and make a little smoothie out of it. Something that'll be very easily and palatable for me to get down to get the rest in. And if I have to use carbohydrates, I'll just use a fucking banana because that'll taste good. What I found was that um, the price of like gluten free milky is up to five dollars for 200 grams of milky. Whereas like that's that's absurd that that's almost that's more that's carbs that are more expensive than protein at that point that you know you can get normal wheat pasta and get 300 grams worth of pasta for a dollar and it's delicious but then you're bloated and you can't get in more food Mm -hmm. whereas rice is the cheapest and the least bloating but you're eating so much rice you're just so sick of it and if it's not Mm -hmm. jasmine so I found that Rice Krispies would be great, but Kellogg's is out of business pretty much because of the stripes. So I'm eating Malta Meals brand crispy rice, which is like the grain bag, horse bag that you would feed bag. <laughs> like 120 grams of crispy rice is like 100 grams of rice. How about Rice Checks? Rice Checks is way more expensive than crispy rice. Crispy rice uh, is fucking geez. cheap. The Aldi, the Aldi's one that I have is like a fucking dollar fifty for a box of rice checks. The oh, big that box. Is, That's cheap. That is, I go to Aldi's and get. It's like, crisp. It's not rice checks. It's it's crisp crisp rice checks. <laughs> rice checks. So it's like protein powder, water over rice cereal. Well, you get corn checks too. Same thing. Like the the corn the corn. It's a non gluten, so that's not going to bloat you at all. But it's, you're still getting the same thing out of it. Some people say that corn is inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. Uh, I've never had any issues with it. Uh, at this point, I'm just, if I'm going to be miserable, I might as well be smart and miserable. Right. So. Well, and, and what I like, so what I've been doing with a blend of either, I put like, depending on what it is, if I cannot get a meal down, I will get matched them with like match the macros with whey protein, isolate, a banana, and then I will fill it out with baby cereal. I put the baby cereal in there, mix everything up, blend it up with ice in there and everything. And I just drink the fucking smoothie and, and I can get that down. One thing I found was that like a cream of rice, uh, Karina taught me a trick where you boil the water first and then you pour the cream of rice into the water and stir yeah. it. It's so much easier than using the microwave and having it boil over. It actually yeah, I, don't, I don't like it hot. I won't, I don't eat that hot. That's why I'll use baby cereal instead of cream of rice. So I don't like it hot. The baby cereal mixes in exactly the same way as the cream rice, and it's cold. It's easy to eat. I don't like it hot either. What I do is I take frozen blueberries and then mix mm-hmm. them. Throw it in there. And then it cools off the cream of rice. It becomes room temperature relatively quickly. Yeah. Well, there's no shortage of baby cereal. But it's hard finding cream of rice, which is fucking stupid. Well, I order it from India. It's not yeah. actually staple in India, and you can get it much cheaper from India than you can buy the little orange box rice and they're like three dollars each for like 11 ounces if you can find it now yeah right it's impossible to find i don't know what the fuck is going on with that but it's easier to get cream rice from india than it is from an american company right now yeah yeah so i just i just started switching over to baby cereal like six months ago and it works it's fine because i can find every type of flavored baby cereal or regular baby cereal that i want if i want to however i want to make that work and it get the big huge go to walmart and get the huge huge boxes of it and stuff and one will pretty much last me all week so whereas like a box of cream of rice i'm going through that about every three days right it's just so expensive and what's funny is like kuba made up an observation is like when you cheat to try to get extra calories in because you're behind you end up fucking yourself because the fat in the cheat meal makes you not hungry for like six hours yeah, and I don't want to eat. I've told that to people, but it's like by the time it's time for the sixth meal, everybody's closed. So you can't have your cheat meal last because shit closes down at like 9 or 10 p.m., not like it used to be where things were open till midnight or 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. And it's really fucking frustrating. So. What are you going to do? It's like you can either never cheat and have nothing but alternating chicken and rice meals and cereal and whey meals 
forever, and you're basically limited to chicken, whey, and rice, which can't possibly be micronutrient appropriate. There's no micronutrients in those three things. Or you mix it up with some abnormal meals for some variety and sanity, not because you're hungry, just because you're fucking bored of eating the same garbage, but it's you're going to take two or three meals out of your day just yeah. because of the slow digestion time of that meal. Well, all you could do is you could order it early, have it delivered, and like if you're doing a burger and fries, go pick it up, have them make it, have them make it without like lettuce and tomato and shit on it. Just have that stuff at home. Cut up the tomatoes, put the lettuce on it, and everything else. Now you have a cheeseburger that you just have to reheat. I can make a burger at that point. If I'm exactly, gonna dress- exactly. Might as well, and then, but then, then again, if you're going to do that, you're better off just buying the fucking fries, right? Or if you have a fryer, you just throw the yeah, fries yeah, in the fucking I, deep fryer for, for, for 10 minutes and make your own hamburger and call it good. And you don't even need to do that. You just buy the Alexa brand. Alexa brand, like ah, a yeah. potato waffle fries. A bag of those is, I think, $3.50. It's 120 carbs and 30 grams of fat. I just do. I just take sweet potatoes and, and chip them up and throw them in my air fryer. That's what I do. I do that too. But if I want to create the illusion of having a cheat meal, then I got base. There's like I have these go tos at the grocery store that I can buy and then make it myself. And then well, I you can always that. you could always do too. Is you could always just have like uh, you know another option is having frozen pizza in the in the refrigerator or in the freezer making that as your last meal, as your cheat meal, and then drinking a protein shake with it to get the protein value in. And now you've got, you've got a, that's probably an optimal cheat meal at that point too, because you have extra sodium, extra fat, extra carbohydrates in there that you would need for calorie dense, and you're still going to get the protein in. I used to do that too. The, um, what I found was the price of a CPK oven baked pizza is like five ninety nine or six ninety nine. I could go to Hungry Howie's, which is across my street, and it's ten ninety nine. For yeah, a larger, are they, are they open at midnight? Yeah, they are. And okay, then, then you're fine. Calories for that pizza, and I get yeah. light cheese like sauce. If I go to Little Caesars, I could get a deep dish, and that's 3,200 calories. But that'll fuck me up for three days. Whereas yeah, I don't, my digestion doesn't even change from the thin crust Howie Hungry Howie's pizza. There's not yeah. enough gluten in the thin crust for my digestion to change. If I get the regular pizza, the normal crust pizza, then it's going to fuck up my digestion for at least a day. Yeah. No, I, you're, people, you're, you're right. A lot of people are like, I don't have celiac dog. It's like, listen, if you go gluten free <laughs> six weeks and you have a shit ton of bread all at once, you're going to find out how uncomfortable gluten really is. It's just that people have perpetual IBS. So they don't even know that they have IBS, that they're just yep. used to having really painful, messy bowel movements or diarrhea or constipated or flatulence, that it's always a nightmare. And that they just live in this nightmare realm all the time. And they don't and know any different. Eating. You're like, oh, I eat 4,000 calories. I'm like, but you go to the bathroom like five times a day and it's messy. So of that 4,000 calories, how much did you absorb? Like 2,500? Yeah. So, like, maybe if you ate 3,000 clean calories that were all hypoallergenic, gluten-free, sugar-free foods, you would grow faster, even though you're eating less total calories. You'd grow faster, and you would shit more normally, and, and, and it would be only be once a day, and it would be timely. It would probably be – really, what I found is when you get that point, it's the same time every single day, like clockwork, and that's it. And it's yeah. never messy and it never and it never hurts and you don't have gas, right? And it's like, okay, this is just the way it should be. And right. then like you said, go eat one thing off menu one day, and for two days your digestion is fucked up if you eat too much of it. Right. And then people just live like that. And that's yeah. that that's their life. And it's yeah. I don't and they have no idea like what life would be more convenient if they just didn't eat like that. Yeah. And that they, you just have to titrate it. Like um, Nelson made a comment that Martin can have one bagel and he's okay. He has two bagels and he's fucked. He's, he's fucked up. And I, I noticed the exact same thing. As as said that, if I have blocks and bagel and have two bagels, I'm fucked. If I have blocks and bagel and have one bagel and a protein shake, 
and for, to make up for the extra calories that I'm not getting from the bagel and the lox, just having half the food, I'm fine. Especially yeah. if it's going to be four hours before I have another meal. If I'm cramming the meals in every 90 minutes, then I can't have any fucking food at all. The only thing yeah. I can, can the only thing that gets ready to go in this process in 90 minutes with me is cream of rice or rice cereal. If I go yeah. to like, Jasmine rice, I'm not going to be hungry again in two hours. Yeah, I literally have no gluten right now at all. And what I'm eating, trying to slam down and try to get all this food in. It's, it's, I mean, if I had any gluten at all, it wouldn't even be possible to get half of it in. There's no way. Because it's, I haven't been eating oatmeal. I've just started using the baby cereal, right? So it's cream of rice. All my meals are fucking rice or white potato, right? And I try to limit the white potato because of some of the starch and stuff in there. So where, where, where it was 12 ounces of fucking potato, I've cut it down to six ounces of potato and filled in the rest with rice. It's a lot of fucking food, but <laughs> it's still easier to get down than all 12 ounces of potato. Because what I found out was a 12 ounce of potato meal because it's a beef and potato meal. The next one is a struggle to get in. And I either have to wait an hour extra to get it in. And that fucks up the next one after that. Or I'm literally force feeding the next one to the point where I'm uncomfortable. So I've been I've been putting more rice in that and less potato. And that's worked out okay. But there's literally no gluten anywhere in there. And if I I'm, I don't even want to know what would happen right now, like after a week of this, like I'm going to I got a cheat meal coming up here at this weekend. I'm debating whether I'm not whether I'm just going to be something that's going to be very low gluten or not, because I know that if I do pizza, if I do something with like a bun, like a, a burger with a bun or something where there's a lot of it. I'm going to be fucked for a day. That's why I don't go totally gluten free. I might have. One bagel with almond milk, one with, with almond butter. I might have, like, I will try to have gluten at least once every two days in a small amount so that if I have a burger with a bun, I don't notice the bun. Or the thin crust pizza, the amount of bread in a thin crust pizza, even though it's 180 carbs, it doesn't actually seem like that much. If I can slam that whole pizza fast and I can get it in one meal, then I don't really notice. Too much. I lose like four or five hours off that meal. I'll have a protein shake instead of a solid food two hours after that. And then I'm back on track about five hours after that. I would rather get the 6,000 calories in every single day than worry about getting one cheat meal a week. Oh, for sure. But that's what I'm saying is to me, cheat meals aren't even a psychological break. Yeah, it, they don't care. <laughs> That it's the concept of a de-stressor to be able to slam in enough calories quickly. Yeah, I to personally myself, I would like I'll do. I think what I'll end up doing is I'll just buy a pint of Ben and Jerry's, eat my last meal, and then eat the as much of the ice cream as possible. That's my fucking cheat meal, and then that's it. And go to bed. I heard that they've got a version that's called oat milk. That is a they dairy. Yeah, that's obviously what I would have to turn to if I ever got to that point, because I'll still want it, but that's $5, and I can't afford $150 a month worth of ice cream. You know, like to me... Doing it one, I'm doing one a week. I'm not going to do that much. It's uh, ridiculous. No, I would have, just, that would be my cheat meal. Like, that's my, that's my... Instead of getting, like, a doing a burger and fries or something that's going to fuck up my stomach real bad, or, or pizza that I know is going to screw me up for two days... This is an extra calorie meal that I need whenever I need that. I'm better off doing that or having gummy bears or something like that. And maybe the Snickers bar with the last meal that's already there to get those calorie count up rather than, than doing a whole, a whole meal. Yeah, I would I say that, uh, what is it? A normal tub of Ben and Jerry's pints about 1,100 calories. The earth, depending frozen, on which one it is, yeah. Yeah, the frozen yogurt one, which is low calorie low fat is 700 mm -hmm. but what's funny is if you get a pint of like the twix ice cream that's still only 700 calories same thing with oreo ice cream is like 700 calories because i used to do a pint a day just to get extra calories and even though i was like pretty much dairy allergic it's like i just didn't care i needed to get those calories in at all costs. <laughs> so i would have um a pizza and a pint of ice cream every three days 
and that, you know, like after arms before legs, right? And it's like everyone knows you do not have a dirty sheet the day before legs because then it's really uncomfortable trying to train legs. You know, like I, I hate doing that. Mm. Well, it depends on the uncomfortable. Is it uncomfortable with the amount of pump or is it uncomfortable with the amount of bloat in the stomach trying to get down into a squat position? Yeah. Yeah. It's like just having unevacuated garbage in your system then and then you're compressing your core down on top of your swollen intestine. It's just not a fun feeling. It definitely takes your mind-muscle connection out the window. It becomes a mind-colon um, connection. Yeah. <laughs> You're shitting your shitting pants at the bottom of your squats. <laughs> it's like not good, but it's so like to, instead, I think it's like important to do like if there was a way to clean carb load, but basically you're having six meals a day that is a high carb. They are carb loaded. Yeah, yeah my, right, like, right now my whole day is a carb load right now. Yeah, it's like what's a cup of rice? <laughs> like 150 grams. So it's like I'm having three cups of rice and five ounces of uncooked meat six times a day that's impossible how would anyone get that done but that's yeah, what I, it breaks down to is you got like a roman fritz diet and you're 100 pounds lighter than the dude most right now most of my meals are eight ounces of cooked protein with 400 grams of rice and some small trace amounts of fat pushed in there that's a lot of food dude that's 400 grams of fucking rice is a is a mound like this I mean, I mean, that comes out to be eight ounces of cooked meat. That's 64 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. Then you get 400 grams of rice. That's like 100. It's 120 grams of carbs. Yeah. So that therefore, you're really looking at 80 grams of protein because 10% of your carbs and rice are all rice. protein. Yep. So you're having an 80, 120 meal that ends up being an 800 calorie meal, not counting fat. 800 calories, six times a day, that's 480 calories. If you added some oil to that rice so that it digests properly, then it's gonna slow down all those meals, but you'd add in a lot more food. Right. No, like and, that's, and that's, pretty, that's pretty much everything that I'm getting in for all, all of my meals right now. On top of that, there's vegetables in there too and stuff for, you know, for fiber and, and, and vitamins and everything else. And then you've got, so that's six there. But then on my training days, it's more whey protein with, with uh, cream of rice or baby cereal and banana post training to get glycogen reloaded and everything else. So it's like, you know, you're at 6,000 calories in a heartbeat before you know it and struggling to get all of it in. And when I don't have that much of an appetite anyway, so anything over four is a struggle for me. I've got to literally force feed and I've got to push it up very slowly to get to this point. So now I'm just, I don't know if I can get any more in. I told Justin this last week, I was like, I physically cannot eat anymore. And I don't like to say that, but I'm saying I physically can't eat anymore. So I'm going to have to start drinking calories. That's the only way. And I may have to turn to and stuff, you know, slamming a Sprite or something or a couple of Sprites before bed on that last meal in order to get the calories in. If we need to add extra calories, it's going to have to be in the last meal. So I've got six to eight hours to sleep it off so that I can get up and eat again. I'm so cheap. I wouldn't even do that. What I would do is I would just take Domino sugar and scoop 30 grams of sugar and throw it in a protein shake and, I can do that and then too. add sugar to my protein shakes rather than spending money on right because coca-cola hates white people <laughs> even money anymore they're no, I mean that's that, that's another that's another one too. I mean, if the sprite, if the the amount of carbonation and it starts fucking with my stomach, then I'll have to I'll have to do that. I'll just do with the do the sugar route and do that. So I yeah. had or I dextro didn't... dextrose powder. I could just throw that would probably be a better a better option yet is to throw de dextrose in there or, or uh, you know my because dextrose is fucking dirt cheap too. I mean, it's dirt dirt cheap. I mean, I go with um, Domino sugar sucralose because it's sweeter. Mm -hmm. But I could throws, but like I had, I went, I had Subway because I was out. You know, it's it's a reasonable thing. It's expensive, so that's why it's a downside. Sixteen dollars for a hundred carbs and eighty grams of protein. Yeah. But I, I ended up getting the, the drink, and instead of having Coke or Diet Coke, caffeine, 
because it's at the point where if I have one Diet Coke, I am not going to be able, or Diet Pepsi, I'm not going to be able to sleep for like four or five hours yeah. longer than usual. Like I'll be going to bed at 3 a.m. as opposed to midnight if I have one serving of caffeine, even 30 milligrams now. So like I had, I made it with half vitamin water and half Fanta. And I didn't think Fanta had any caffeine, but I was up until 5 a.m. <laughs> Like nine hours later, when I went to bed, I still laid there for five hours, unable to sleep. Could have used that the other day. Because like I said, I was up for, I got up at three o'clock on Wednesday and I didn't go to sleep until uh, 8.30 this morning. It's crazy how effective caffeine is if you never have it. It's like how drug. Yeah, what's funny is that I have, uh, the only soda I've really been drinking is very, very low caffeine. Like right now, there's very little in Diet Dr. Pepper. So, and that's, and I'm just the first one I've had in days. But I'm like, like the sugar free root beer, if I throw, there's no caffeine in that, right? Other, other than that, it's water that I drink. I haven't been drinking coffee at all. The only other caffeine I get is from a pre workout. And I've been limiting that too because I just don't, I'm finding that I sleep better, you know, and especially working at night and stuff, I'm sleeping way better during the day without any caffeine. It's easy for me to go to sleep. I crash right out and then I can sleep six hours really, really hard. And if I need a nap later on, I do. So I'm trying, I'm doing the same thing, limiting the caffeine. I mean, I had to cut out the pre-workout because I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And I was reduced my pre-workout level to an eighth of a scoop. And I was still, I was getting great workouts, but I was not sleeping. And as soon as I cut out all pre-workout, all caffeine, no caffeine at all, then I was, like, at this point, if I take 10 grams of dark chocolate, not like dark chocolate, cocoa, not even dark chocolate, I think 10 grams of cocoa and mix it in with cream of rice or oatmeal, I will be so hyper at the gym that, like, the one time I was super tired and I had uh, half a scoop of Fenris. The first set of the day was adductor. I ro- tore my groin. Like it made me so much stronger. And I, I guess I'm so fragile. I ripped my groin from using my own pre workout. That's how strong that shit is. I used <laughs> a half a scoop of free work of Fenris Fury and ripped my groin open. <laughs> it's like, I was like, I don't know how fucking. People do a whole scoop of this shit. That's fucking nuts. Or two. Or two. <laughs> I've never met anyone who admitted to using two, except once Brittany said that she um accidentally had two scoops. And she was like, I'm FaceTiming me and cleaning the inside of her car at three in the morning. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I don't know. I just can't stop moving. I was like, how many scoops of pre-workout did you have? And she's like, shut up. I was like, how many? She's like, I had two in a monster. I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's at 11, 800 milligrams of caffeine right there. I'm like, you wake up at 11 p.m. to go to work, and then you're at work, and you're in the parking lot hearing voices and hiding in your car, and then you get bored hiding in your car, and you're cleaning the inside of your car with Windex at two in the morning. I was like, just how does that not make sense you overdid it with the stimulus. Well, that, that is what I did here the last, because I had to be awake last night, is I took a scoop of, of Fenris before I, went to, before I went to work. And I was up until 8.30 in the morning, wide awake. I finally crashed out. I mean, I, I sat on the couch and ate, and then I started watching TV, and I crashed out and woke up at 10.30 and said, okay, I'm going, going to bed now. But, yeah, that, that got me. And I was, and I, this, this was me before that. Like, this is me. Trying, trying to stay awake because I had been up since, you know, the day before three o'clock in the afternoon and I had tried to sleep yesterday, but I just couldn't, I couldn't do it because of what was going on. And and then um, last night, I'm like, I got to make it through work somehow. Well, we haven't done this in a while. Fenris drink and it's like three o'clock in the morning and I'm just, this is me <laughs> wide awake. I don't even know what would fucking happen. I don't even know what would happen if I did a whole scoop of Fenris. Or like three, three caps of wrath and a half a scoop of fundraise. That would just scare the fuck out of me. I'd be a different person. Three, three caps, three caps. I'm ripped for two days. 
<laughs> no, it's like anyone, I don't know a single person that takes the full serving size of, uh, and people are like, why do you make this shit so strong? I'm like, I use the clinically proven dose of every ingredient. I don't turn them down because I'm using them in a synergistic formula. I'm just like pushing the envelope on every ingredient and then using them just right. And you don't need to use the maximum dose. It's like just because the barbell loads 800 pounds doesn't mean you should put 800 pounds, pounds on there. You could probably get away with four and it's going to do just as good. Or you use 100 with a nine second rep right. <laughs> for 10 reps and do that 100 pounds for 90 seconds while feeling the muscle. Oh, man. All right. I'm going to go eat and then I'm going to go try have- back. I'm I'm hungry and tired at the same time, and I just woke yeah. up. I I might actually eat, take a nap, and then go train back because I'm still tired from the last two days. So, dude, every time I can't drag drag myself out of bed, like I'm like, oh, it's four twenty four, and I'm supposed to be at the gym at five. I cannot get out of bed. If I go lift, it's gonna suck, or I'm gonna hurt myself, or I'm gonna get sick. Mm-hmm. If I, if I'm, yeah, I mean, I do not want to get out of bed. If I just stay in bed, I'll wake up three hours later and feel great, and I can go mm-hmm. to the gym and, and get a phenomenal workout. Yeah. People, well, I, I haven't been having any issues like like sleeping on this schedule. It's usually I'm in bed by eight o'clock and I'm awake at three. I if there's cardio do I do the cardio then I eat then I eat again then I go to the gym then I come home. My food is already made because in between the two first two eatings, I got all the food made for the night that I need. It's already in the fridge and ready to go. So I can come home at that point. I can eat my post-workout and I can lay down and take a nap for an hour and I'm refreshed and ready to go for the whole night. If I don't get that nap in, then I'll have, I'll be a little bit extra tired throughout that. I'll start getting tired and earlier. Um, but the only time I've like had to sleep longer is on the weekends when I don't have to go to work. And I think it's just my body saying, okay, I don't have to work. Then I'll catnap more, right? At night, I'll actually, because I'm not moving around, I'll catnap at night for an hour or so. Then I'm tired. But for the most part, I've been getting decent enough sleep during the day. So I haven't been like I was before where I could, I mean, I I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't sleep enough working at night. I just couldn't do it. Oh, my God. It's it's so fucking weird. I'll wake up. I'll do my morning ritual, do my morning cardio, have a meal, lay down, take a nap, wake up, go to the gym, come home, and then I'll eat and I'll take another nap. (laughs) So I'll get people don't realize, like, yeah, I sleep eight, 10 hours, sometimes 12, but I also have two or three naps that day. Hours a day, and like for those two years when I made all that progress, I was sleeping twelve to eighteen hours every oh, day. Yeah, I, uh, I remember. And I, I was lifting Monday, Wednesday, Friday from like midnight until three a.m. And the whole rest of the week, I did nothing. Sleep, sleep. sleep and eat. That's all I did, and it was so lonely. I didn't even know I was lonely. I was so lonely. It was like so lonely for like from two th- January, December of 2018 until like I got my pro card. I did not do anything the entire time. Except for except sleep, eat, and train. Sleep and eat. I think I had like three dates in that whole three year period. No, five. Five dates in that whole period. Of in like for three years, did nothing but sleep, eat, and sleep, eat, and train. Nothing. Yeah. I saw Bo, the front desk guy at the gym. I saw you on my podcast, on our podcast. I saw my Dungeons and Dragons group, usually on Skype because they're afraid of getting COVID, because right. I'm like typhoid Mary because I go to the gym where apparently all the disease and that I had like five dates in that three year period. And that was <laughs> that was it for like and I what 
<clears throat> won the Michigan, won my class twice at Masters Nationals, technically won my class twice at North American by doing nothing but sleeping, eating, and training. And having sleepy no train. Control. Yeah, that's that's yeah. great though. Yeah. Me and me and my dog were so close. Al, <laughs> Allie just barely talks to me. Yeah. He came in my room. He didn't even say hi to me. He just looked around the floor for some like food and then got bored and left. I was like, did I even get to say hi to me? He looked her over and looked at me and just chuffed and walked away. He's like, oh, I, was, oh. I might get a dog actually, I think. I don't really have anything. I was looking at rescue dogs because I don't want anything I have to train because I don't have the patience to do it. So I was looking at rescue dogs that are already like, you know, potty trained and stuff. Just something a little older that will just be like me and just lay around and do nothing. Oh, that's what my dog is. <laughs> okay with doing it, right? <laughs> my dog makes me look hardworking. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I just sleep, right? dog I've ever had <clears throat> to do shit. <laughs> I just want a I, dog that when, when I lay here, it lays right here just, with me and does nothing, right? Just nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. He doesn't do shit. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, All right, man. I'm gonna eat. I'm gonna eat, and then I'm gonna go right. to go to the gym at some point here. All right. So, Have a good lift. All right. We'll see you. Bye bye.